Mr. Steve, can I call you Steve? You've helped create one of the most profitable tech companies of all time. You had all the money and all the resources to hire the best engineers to work on your software, to write the best code the world has ever seen. But I went down a little rabbit hole, which gave me some questions. Why would such a big and powerful company be so threatened by open source software? To be so bothered by open source that you would call it cancer, or even worse, communism. communism. Tell me, is that penguin after your coins? Is it after your market share? I had to study, I had to do my own research. I had to find out what Soros-like entity is behind such an evil operation. And that powerful and mysterious evil entity, well, in Microsoft's eyes, was the GPL. GPL stands for the GNU General Public License. This is like a redundant acronym, I guess. It's a family of widely used free software licenses that guarantee users the freedom to run, study, share, and modify the software. And open source operating systems like Linux are free to download and use because at their core, the kernel is licensed under the GPL. Now here's where I wanna clear up some common misconceptions. You can sell GPL software. What you can't do is sell it under a restrictive license. If you distribute it, you have to also provide the source code and give people the same rights that you had. So yes, you could charge for a Linux distro, but customers could also share it freely, which makes it hard to paywall that experience. So why would a big company like Microsoft be so concerned about what little old Linux is up to? When I see a big and powerful entity getting very vocal about a small minority, I get curious. At first, I thought maybe Microsoft wanted to incorporate Linux into Windows. You take something that's free, slap your name on it, and sell it at a premium. That would fit right into the capitalist playbook. But that wasn't the case. Microsoft didn't need GPL code to make Windows desktops better at the time. They were pretty much dominating the market. So why did they care so much? It's because Microsoft saw the future. And the future was Linux. Now I don't mean Linux desktop. That, and still is, a minority compared to Windows and Mac OS. The real threat was Linux in the server room. Balmer and Gates could see companies moving towards hosting their own servers cheaply, and Microsoft hadn't yet established a dominance there. If Linux became the default for enterprise servers, it could block Microsoft from charging a premium price for those same capabilities. But Linux was already ahead in these key areas. Networking protocols, compilers and developer tools, server infrastructure software like Apache and Samba, both open source also, and also virtualization. And instead of Microsoft trying to close that gap with smart investments and innovation, they went the cheaper route, propaganda and fear-mongering. They tried to scare the companies away from using GPL software. The fear that they were trying to spread was about accidental contamination. If GPL code slipped into your proprietary products, Microsoft argued it could trigger legal headaches by forcing companies to open source their own software. And that's why Balmer was using those specific buzzwords. He called it cancer because in his words, the GPL spreads to everything it touches. And then he called it communism because in his framing, sharing software freely was the opposite of capitalism. So we got capitalism, that's the good C. Communism, that's the bad C. And cancer, that's the big C. See? All right, so next up is the Halloween documents. So as we all know, the greatest threat to Western civilization is volunteers. So 1998 Microsoft being the heroes that they were, came out to beat those nasty volunteers into the ground by waging war against open source. The Linux community didn't even know they were in a war at the time, and they were made aware of what would eventually be deemed the Halloween documents. The Halloween documents are about a series of confidential Microsoft memos, and the memos were about what Linux and the open source community were up to. Both the leaked documents and the responses were published by Eric Raymond in 1998. Maybe the Halloween documents deserve their own video. You let me know. But there are 11 items in that list, and they fall into three categories. So the first category are the first two items, which are the actual leaked memos for Microsoft. Those were the only two private documents that got made public. The rest were already public. The information in those leaked documents is actually interesting though. Even from 1998, it showed that Microsoft really viewed Linux as a threat. They talked about using FUD tactics against Linux, that's spreading fear, uncertainty, and doubt. The leaks kind of revealed that that was one of Microsoft's big marketing strategies. I don't think there were many questions around the authenticity of these documents, but they were actually used as evidence in a 2007 case. So everything that we've talked about so far gets us up to about year 2002. In 2002, Microsoft launched the Shared Source Initiative. It was a very tightly controlled alternative to open source. It was a thing to attract developers to make software only for Microsoft. And that was sort of their last middle finger to Linux. And boy, would they regret it. So that wraps up in 2002. 
They don't mention Linux again until 2009. So what happened in those seven years? Linux happened, and in a way bigger fashion than even Microsoft could have predicted. So Linux never stopped gaining traction. Big players like IBM, Oracle, HP, all started backing Linux publicly. IBM invested $1 billion into Linux development in 2001. Web hosting servers, supercomputers, and even early cloud servers ran on Linux, mostly because it was cheap, stable, and scalable. And as all this was going on, Microsoft server revenue started to plateau. The early 2000s was when the internet really started to boom. MySQL, PHP, and later Python became the foundation of the web. Software developers were starting to use full open source stacks. LAMP was an acronym, Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. This software stack could build startups way faster than Windows. This was cultivating a developer generation that didn't need to depend on Microsoft at all. And now think about the enterprise world. They loved their Windows desktops, but they also loved their cheap Linux servers. CIOs started demanding that Microsoft software play nice with their Linux networks, Samba file shares, and open protocols. And in the mid-2000s, the EU actually put out a lawsuit for Microsoft if they didn't add interoperability between Microsoft and Linux. But that final nail in the coffin that made Microsoft come out of hiding after seven years was virtualization. Virtualization became a huge need in the enterprise world. Companies wanted to use virtualization software like VMware so employees could still use their Windows desktop environments that they were used to, but running on a Linux server. So Microsoft had to play ball if they wanted to compete, which leads to 2009. And in 2009, Microsoft contributes 20,000 lines of GPL licensed Hyper-V code. And Hyper-V was the Windows virtualization software. And this led to a bunch of Linux servers with VMware installed running Windows virtual machines. By 2011, Microsoft became one of the top five contributors to the Linux kernel. And also Microsoft Azure by then was hosting Linux virtual machines and supporting major distributions. And in 2014, Microsoft completely flipped on Linux launching WSL and publicly embracing open source. This is something that I want to just make sure I drill home. Microsoft loves Linux. 20% of Azure is already Linux. And then in 2016, the WSL was launched. That is the Windows subsystem for Linux. This let developers install Linux on a Windows machine, use Linux applications, utilities, commands. And this was all native on Windows, no virtual machine or dual boot setup. And also in 2016, we got our buddy Steve Ballmer to admit that his comments were of the time and endorsed the new CEO's more open source approach. And as a result of that, approximately 66% of customer cores on Microsoft Azure are running Linux. Now look, we all like to have a little fun. I like to make jokes about Microsoft. It's an easy thing to do, I know. I think this story is more of a testament to how important it is to protect open source and make corporations play by the rules when it comes to using the hard work and time of open source contributors. And if you like this video, check out this one I made about a fighting game fan turned open source software developer that pretty much saved the fighting game genre. And subscribe if you thought communist Jimmy Fallon was funny. Thanks for watching though. Peace.